everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are The Minimalists. We're here with Malabama. Hi, everybody. Well, we also got the rest of our team here, and it seems that we're missing someone. <laughs> Don't worry, he's not late. He's just not going to be here today. T.K. Coleman is in Detroit this week. He's speaking at several schools, helping some kids understand what it means to live a meaningful life with less. He'll be back on the episode next week, but don't worry. We have a special guest today. You'll be introduced to her in a moment. Coming up today on this free public minimal episode, we're talking to a listener about dealing with a disrespectful family member. We also have an outstanding lightning round segment a live stream question, and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 377, where we answer four times the questions and we dive deep into several simple living segments. You can check that out at patreon.com slash The Minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because say it with me, y'all. Advertisements Advertisements suck. suck. We'll start with our callers. If you have a question or comment for our show, give us a call, 406-219-7839, or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Joy. My 70-year-old mother is living with me. She's on Social Security and only gets by with help of my father, her ex-husband, reluctantly, and me. She's been mentally abusive since I can remember, but she is totally oblivious to it. She's quite delirious in many areas, and I say that with some respect. I told her my only rule for living in my house was going to therapy, a decision I started questioning asking. After knowing what I do about changing people, acceptance, expectations, I've still done everything. Begged countless times, thinking if I show how painful this is for me, she would go. If she doesn't live in my house, she's homeless. Her living here is causing me such mental agony. Us living together was always extremely toxic, and I feel incredibly stuck. She's living in my daughter's room while my daughter is cramped in mine. I consider her a level one hoarder and has a major shopping addiction. She doesn't respect any of my rules around bringing things into my house. My house is now cluttered. Lately, I felt that maybe I should put focus on grieving her. Even though she's 10 feet away from me, our relationship is completely done. And I've asked her to not speak to me as much as possible until she has gotten some help, Hmm. making this feel similar to a death, but it was a boundary I felt necessary. Hmm. Knowing I cannot change or force someone to get help if they don't want to, but being forced to live to go or live together, where do I go from here? Joining us in the studio today to help us answer this question and several other questions as well is Lori Gottlieb. She's not only a therapist, but she's the author of this new book, although it's a journal, really. It's called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, The Journal. And as you can see, I have a whole lot of tabs here, Lori. We're going to be diving deep into this book today. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Gottlieb. Yeah! (laughs) Now, it's a warm introduction, but for a very serious question. Yes. Joy's question, she has a mother who she perceives to be disrespectful, to not be attentive to her needs, to her desires, to the family dynamic that we have going on here. And I think it's probably important to highlight, I'm really interested in, in your point of view here, that every relationship has some sort of cost of admission, right? Mm-hmm. Because... I'm not going to be in a relationship, a business relationship, friendship with Ryan if he's constantly disrespectful to me or if he doesn't appreciate my own desires, my own wants, my own needs out of life. But I wanted to start with a chapter from your, not a chapter, a a selection from your book here. This is on page 76. And you have a quote here. Our relationships can't change until we have something new to bring to them. Mm. Yeah. Now, Ryan's been using the journal as well. Yeah. And uh, maybe you could talk about that in a little bit here. But I thought that was a great quote to start to address Joy's conundrum that she's having with her mother. Yeah, that's that's exactly where I was going to go, which is that. I think that she's expecting that she's going to have some kind of relationship with her mother that she's wanted for a very long time. 
and that if she sets boundaries and then her mother gets help, that something will change with the mother. Um, But nothing's really going to change with the mother because she's not changing. And so she needs to, first of all, understand what her mother's limitations are. And I think that the when she said she's grieving already, like as if she's dead, I think what she's grieving is the relationship that she wanted to have with her mother that she's probably not going to have. That is not who her mother is. So that's where the grieving comes in. And that's where the fight is that she's having. She's having this fight, like, I need you to be this person. I'm being very reasonable. Why can't you be reasonable? Mm. Right? Um, and And so I think she needs to kind of change what her, um, the dance that she's doing with her mother, you know, we all do these, this dance with somebody else, right? And so if you change your dance steps, the other person either has to change their dance steps or they're just going to fall flat on the floor. Mm -hmm. So she needs to change her dance steps, which is obviously her mother has not responded well to, hey, you need to get help. Her mother doesn't seem interested in that. Um, you know, she's telling her mother, don't talk to me as much as possible, which doesn't seem like a very tenable Mm. situation. Um, So I think it's more about grieving that her mother is not the person and she's not going to have the relationship that she wanted. But could she have a different relationship where she doesn't have those kinds of expectations? And what will happen if she changes and then maybe the mother doesn't feel so criticized, disliked, um, you know, unwelcome? What might happen there? Mm. Man, I got a lot of empathy for Joy. I am, um, yes. I, and I'm not the only one who's got, you know, mom and dad issues. I mean, I think everyone's got them to a certain extent. Um, yeah, I mean, for me uh, and my mother specifically. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to like talk about uh, Joy's question here in an observational way rather than like prescribing Joy something here. But so that's what I'll do. I'll talk about my my relationship with my mom. Um, I wanted our relationship to be a certain way. And I wanted that ever since I was a kid. Um, It did not go that way. Um, In fact, it went probably the completely opposite direction of where I wish, you know, a a mother-son relationship would be. So what I did uh, when I got older and, um, you know, got my own job, got out of the house, is I pretty much stopped talking to her. And, um, you know, she would call me up and, hey, why don't you talk to me? And, you know, you don't call me enough and da-da-da-da. And I'm like, mom, like, I love you, but you know, here are the issues that I have. And, um, I, I, I don't, I don't owe you anything, you know, like, I don't know what else to say. That was not the best approach because it didn't foster anything between my mom and I. Hmm. And I'll tell you the last like six or seven years, I've been working really hard to have a good relationship with her. And where it started, um, was I had this kind of revelation about, I don't know. I was having like a pity party party for myself. Like, oh, you know, mom doesn't understand me. She doesn't get my struggles, you know. And He's very emo. Yeah, it's very emo. I was <laughs> listening to uh, some Fallout Boy. And, <laughs> and but then it hit me. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, I want my mom to understand my battles. And my mom has her own battles that I refuse to try and understand. Um, and it hit me where I was like, oh, if I want this relationship to go anywhere, I have to be the one who shows my mom that I at least understand where she's coming from. And then that will hopefully open up a possibility for her to kind of, you know, see where I'm coming from. And I called her up one day and I said, hey, mom, I just want to let you know. Um, I was sitting around thinking and um, I had this huge epiphany that um, I've never really showed you how I understand that you have a lot going on. And I really want to res- not just understand your battles, but I want to respect your battles. And in order for uh, for me to do that, um, you know, we need to figure out uh, what, you know, what you need, what I need. So let's talk about that. And I, hey, what do you need? And she kind of just asked me, you know, call her once a week and a couple other things. And I'm like, great, I would do that for you. Absolutely, mom. And I'll tell you when I did that, she started to um, see my battles and started to respect, respect my battles a little bit more. And we still you know, get into it sometimes. But, you know, like Josh said, every relationship is going to have some type of cost. But I'll tell you, like, when I when I approach it in that way of looking at my mom, uh, because I, cause I do love her. And to love someone is to, you know, see them for who they are without wanting to change them. And, and that's the approach that I've taken with my mom. And um, man, like going out of my way to show her that not only do I respect her battles, but I I hear what her problems are. And 
Um, just be a good listener. Like that has completely changed our relationship. You know, one more thing I'll say too, that was really hard for me to accept was, you know, we all think parents should be a certain way. Yeah. You know, um, I don't, I, I don't know why uh, this is, but, you know, I expected my mom and dad to know everything. They had me, my dad was 22. My mom was 20. And I am 41 years old right now. I don't have a lot figured out. <laughs> so I don't know why my younger self would expect my mother and my father to have it figured out at 20 and 22. Um, and then what that kind of led me to was I have to be the parent to my parent. And that is such a difficult thing. I, I, I would say more, you have to be the teacher to your parents. Mm. Because I think that we don't want to have to parent our parents. Um, you know, when we're young, we call that the parentified child, which is, you know, your parents haven't sort of grown up and you're the child who kind of sees what needs to happen and you take all this on all this sort of adult responsibility. And that's that's really problematic. Mm. Um, when we get older and we're adults and we feel like, OK, I don't rely on my parents in the same way. But emotionally, we still want our parents to be our parents. And so I think that if you think about it as being the teacher I that, love that. that my parents, the, I'm talking for you now, mm -hmm. were 20 and 22 when they had me and they didn't know a lot. And I have the benefit of having done work on myself. I have the benefit of having learned a lot of things. And I actually can teach them things that will not only help them, but will help our relationship. You know, I have a, a podcast called The Dear Therapist Podcast, and we had someone come on and he was saying, you know, I, I, I'm having this child and my, my parents didn't know how to sort of be parents to me. And I don't want them to do that around the grandchild. And I want to be a good dad. And we really helped this person to see like, you have some things to be, you have knowledge to be a teacher to your parents. And it really changed the relationship, especially with his dad. The mom was a little less open to it at first, but then she came around. The dad was very receptive to it. Mm. So I think if we if we think about it that way. Also, the other thing you mentioned that comes to mind is a lot of times, like when I see couples, for example, it's always about like, you go first, you need to change first. And we do that with our parents. Like, mm -hmm. you need to change mom and dad, right? Before yeah. I will change. You want me to call once a week? Okay, but you got to do this stuff for me. Like, you've got to right. be the parent. And I think that what we see is it's not about who goes first. It's about somebody, again, needs to change their dance steps. Yeah. If you need to change your dance steps first, they will change their dance steps. Might not be right away. It might not be in exactly the way you want. But eventually, you will start to see some movement on the other side. Oh, yeah. I love that context of being a teacher. That is so much more powerful than thinking about, yeah, me having to be uh, my mom's parent. But, you know, it's interesting because what she needed from me, I needed from her. Mm -hmm. And I totally was in this space of like, well, she's my mom. So she's going to have to be the one who gives in first. And then it becomes transactional. Yes. Yeah. Which isn't love at all. And I know that's not what Joy is going for here. What Joy is trying to understand is how do I make this dynamic work? Because we're dancing two completely mm -hmm. different dances right now. Mm -hmm. And we want to be careful not to moralize any of this either. Yes, your mom might be a level one hoarder. I was a level two or level three hoarder. If you look at the whole, we did a whole podcast episode about hoarding and the five different stages of hoarding. That's not a morally bad thing. It's a problem for her and it's especially a problem for you if the stuff is getting in the way. And so when I talk about the cost of admission for a relationship, we know right now that if your mom was coming to your house and beating your walls with a sledgehammer, you would say, hey, you have to get out of my house. This is unacceptable. The cost of admission is you can't beat my walls down with a sledgehammer, right? But now you have to understand what is your non-negotiable or your series of your, your list of non-negotiables. Here are the things that can't happen if you want to live under this roof with me. And if you understand that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too pedantic and make the list of 150 items that can't possibly be followed. But what does respect look like to you? Because my guess is your mom doesn't even understand the ways in which you perceive you're being disrespected. That's right. That's right. I mean, you know, she doesn't realize that, you know, when you're a hoarder, you don't really realize that other people might not might not feel the same way about this. That's right. Um, and I and I think the other thing is, too, when somebody doesn't realize they have a problem and you keep telling them to go 
to therapy, she's kind of like, I don't understand what the problem is. Uh-huh. Mm. Right. So so there's that going on. And I think the, the, the other thing I was thinking about when I was listening to her voicemail was this idea that she said, you know, if I don't take her in, she will be homeless. Mm. And I really wonder about that when people come into therapy and they say, you know, like I'm trapped in this way. Often they're not actually trapped. There might be a, a less than ideal you know, solution to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean that the only solution is that her mother has to live with her. You know, it mm-hmm. reminds me of, in, in maybe you should talk to someone in the book that led to the journal, there's this scene where I'm with my therapist and he said, you know, you remind me of this prisoner. It, it's a cartoon. It's a cartoon. You remember this cartoon and it's a prisoner shaking the bars, desperately trying to get out. Mm-hmm. But on the right and the left, it's open. And you can walk no around bars. bars. You can walk around the bars. Oh, so no. many of us feel like that. We're like shaking the bars. I'm trapped. I'm trapped. I'm trapped. Even though it's open on the right and the left. So what keeps us from walking around the bars? And in Joy's case, I don't know her, but it might be that she's really hoping that she can have a different relationship with her mom. Mm-hmm. That she just, she's not even aware of this. Right. You know, in her, in her mind, she's like, no, 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 that's not what I want. I don't want her to live with me and all that. But maybe there's a part of her and mm-hmm. maybe the younger part of her that feels like maybe something different could happen here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was in a similar predicament. When I, was, when I was 19, my mom had a real bad alcohol problem and I started working more so I could pay my mom's rent because I wasn't going to be living with mom. Mm. And so for me, it meant, now I'm not suggesting this to Joy necessarily, but it, it it was empowering to know that the story I was telling myself, oh, my mom's going to be homeless if she doesn't live with me. Well, Okay, maybe that's true, but maybe there's an alternative solution as well. One other thing I'd like to say is I want to get really clear on the, well, you say she's emotionally abusive. Okay, but you can say that to her. She may have no idea Mm -hmm. what that even means. I want to get specific. What does that emotional abuse look like? I really don't like when you say this. I really don't like when you talk to me this way. When you raise your voice in these scenarios, it makes me feel unheard. Mm. Right. And, And also the thing about boundaries that a lot of people don't understand is they feel like I'm setting a boundary and if the other person doesn't do the thing that I request, then the boundary has been broken. The boundary is something we hold with ourselves. So what I mean by that is if you say to someone, you know, um, I don't like it when you yell at me. That really upsets me. Please don't yell at me anymore. That's not really a boundary. A boundary is part, you say, I don't like it when you yell at me. This is what happens for me when you yell at me. It really scares me. I, I don't like it. It's disrespectful. And if you yell at me, I am going to end the phone call, leave the room, you know, whatever you're going to do. And Mm -hmm. then the boundary is with yourself. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do the thing you said you were going to do? Mm -hmm. And so many times we say, oh, they didn't, they didn't respect my boundary. And then I'm helpless. Mm -hmm. You're not helpless. You have a plan for what you're going to do if someone doesn't respond to your request. A boundary is a request. And then it's, it's the limit that you set with yourself. I will do this. Maybe for her, it's if my mom continues to act in this way, even though I've requested, um, I'm going to figure out a way for her to live somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. And the boundaries I found in my own life. Yes, people will trample your boundaries if you let them, but I was often the one trampling my own boundaries. Mm. And so when we set a boundary, we set it for a reason, and it may be difficult to stick to it because recognizing there are consequences. If someone's not willing to pay the cost of admission for being in this relationship with me, then I need to hold up my end of the bargain. I'm getting a cue from Professor Sean over here. If you hear a little ding in your ear, it's because uh, he's telling us to wrap up in a meaningful way. Uh, Joy, I want to send you a copy of the journal. Maybe you should talk to someone and we're going to be going through this on the rest of the podcast as well. I think you'll find immense value in this book, in this journal, and we'll talk more about it here in a second. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. That's right. You can follow The Minimalist on TikTok, also Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Minimalist. Now, during the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims and the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast so that you can copy and share our pithy answers if you like. Ryan, let's start with you. We got a question from ZZZ Test. 
Because I keep to myself, others misinterpret that as me being mysterious and want to pry. How do I keep other people out of my business? All right, Professor Sean, give me 60 seconds. Here is my pithy answer. Fulfilling other people's expectations is not fulfilling. So here's the thing. I have expectations of uh, Josh as a business partner. I've got expectations as Malabama, as, 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 as one of our employees. I've got expectations of my wife. I've got expectations of my parents. But what I realize is that the more expectations I have for others, the less they get met. And I, I'm flipping that uh, for you, ZZZ test. Um, other people's expectations of you doesn't mean that you have to live up to them. You can respect them. You can try to understand them. You can, uh, you know, be loving and kind without living up to everyone else's expectations because living up to everyone else's expectations is a great recipe for disaster. Yeah. I would just echo what you're saying there. It's a great way to be unsatisfied, to be unfulfilled by trying to fulfill everyone else. Yes. What a great point. Give me 60 seconds, Sean. So, Here's something pithy for you. It's an oldie but a goodie. You can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. <laughs> so no one in my life pries into my business, triple Z. No one in my life is constantly trying to figure out what's going on with me personally because I wouldn't tolerate that kind of behavior. I can't change the people if Ryan all of a sudden wanted to be a nosy Nancy and was constantly asking me, hey, what's going on with this? What's going on with this? And gossiping, the key wouldn't be to make him gossip less. It would be to surround myself with people who don't treat me that way. Mm. And I think that is the key here for Triple Z. It's about letting go of needing the friendships you have right now and moving toward the more empowering relationships that aren't going to pry into your business. So I saw a meme the other day. It was, uh, well, it was a picture of a, um, like a sandwich board sign mm -hmm. on, I think it was on the outside of a bar or a restaurant. It, I swear to God, I think I sent you a picture of it. It said, um, you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. And then it just put unknown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we know exactly who said that. Wait, wait a <laughs> See, I've aspired my whole life to be unknown. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is perfect. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny. I'm like, I know exactly who said that. Come on. It's my new moniker. If you Google it, it'll, it comes up pretty easily. Anyway. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Do these people not have Google? I guess not. It's all good. Uh, right here, right now. By the way, we'll check in with the live stream here in a second. But first, real quick for right here, right now. Here's one thing going on in the life of the minimalists. We are beginning to speak. Ryan and I will go out to universities, to corporations, to conferences, one a month generally. We'll go out and we'll talk to your organization. If you'd like to hire the minimalist to speak, you can reach out to our agent. You can find actually our speaking demo is over there as well as well at theminimalists.com slash speaking. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. You can reach out to us. We'd be happy to have you hire us to come out and speak to your conference, your organization, your group, theminimalists.com slash speaking. For more details, Malabama, let's check in with the Patreon live stream. What do you got for us? We have a question here from Britt. She says, I am constantly cleaning up behind my two-year-old and trying to keep the home tidy. We live very minimally, but I feel like my OCD is getting in the way of me being present as a parent. Any tips on finding a balance? I don't think you want to find balance. It's weird because we don't ever want to find balance in any other area of our life, really, right? We're not looking for balance. We're looking for contentment because you can balance all of the wrong things, the things that are inappropriate for your life, and yes, you could have a bunch of things that are in balance, but not achieve what you're actually trying to achieve. What mm. you're trying to achieve here is, Britt, you want to be present with your two-year-old, right? And yet you're clinging to the idea of the way things should be when a two-year-old isn't present. And I know this from firsthand experience. Ella, when she was two, I think she was trying out for the Taliban. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she terrorized our house. She was too much of a terror for them, actually. <laughs> yes, they rejected yeah. her. <laughs> They're like, she's a little over the top. Yeah. <laughs> and so what I realized, Britt, is I had to 
not forcibly let go because letting go is not something you do. I had to loosen my grip. Hey, yes, I might prefer things to be this way. But what is the worst thing that could happen if it's not this way? I was on our back patio yesterday and there were several little toys strewn across the the patio. And yes, my OCD was like, hey, it shouldn't be this way. Mm. But what's the worst thing that could happen? I might step on one. Mm -hmm. But even then, I see them, so I'm not going to step on one. And so I recognize that my expectation I had, the hope that I had, oh, I hope things are going to be this way, actually got in the way of what? Me being present with my daughter. And as soon as I let go of that hope or that expectation and just accepted reality for what it was, Hmm. and I can't prescribe that to you. I can't say just accept things for how they are. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. But if you see things for how they are, you'll recognize the way you want the world to be is different from the way the world is. And that is why you're experiencing the discontent. There's no other reason. Mm. Britt, I totally understand the essence of your question here. Like, when do you just give up on cleaning up after your two-year-old and and uh, uh, kind of let things be the way that they are? And Josh is right. Like, there's no magic bullet answer here to let you, uh, to make you let go of those expectations that you have. But what I'll say is this, as a two-year-old, they're messy. They're really, really messy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you've got to clean up after them. Um, the answer isn't to just stop cleaning up after them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but you know what I'll say is it will get easier as time goes on. And then you could show them how to help you, show them how to uh, uh, raise the standards for themselves. But yeah, this is a temporary time. It's going to get better for you, Britt. Yes, indeed. We'll check back in with the live stream here in a little bit. But first, Malaban, what do you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, my name is Lisa Benson, and I'm calling from Waltham, Mass. I've been thinking a lot about souvenirs when you go on a trip. Lately, or recently, our 10-year-old niece came up to visit us, and she bought something small for every family member to show that she was thinking of them when she was visiting and traveling. Um, But I'm thinking of a different way that you could show that to a friend or family member without having to buy them something, which is... Uh, they give you something small to take with you, maybe it's a drawing or a treasured object or whatever. And uh, you take a picture of that, that object at uh, some landmark or a special place or moment, and you share that photo with them. So it's like a piece of them was with you on the trip. That is our minimal episode for today. We'll see you on Patreon for the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 377, which includes a million more questions from our listeners. And Lori tackles some of those questions with us, a private minimalist home tour, a special photo from Danny Unknown. We've got our infamous obsolete objects and impulse purchases segments. We have several new rules for decluttering. We have an outstanding added value segment for you. Ryan, it is the vibiest song I've heard in a long time. We also have uh, much, much more of less. If you want to hear all that, check out the Minimalist Private Podcast episode this week at patreon.com slash The Minimalist or click the link in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to all of our archives all the way back to episode 001. Yes, indeed. Big thanks to Lori Gottlieb. You can check out Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, the journal. We'll also put a link to her podcast in the show notes as well. You can find those at theminimalists.com slash podcast. All right, y'all. If you leave here today with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it